In September of 2009, ATI released their Radeon HT5870, which brought about the next generation of GPUs with its fantastic performance and DirectX 11 features. However, there was a barrier to entry with these new cards, as even the cheapest option, the HD5850, would have run you a cool $300 back then. Mid-range gamers wanted a truly affordable option in ATI's new lineup, and as a result, ATI answered their calls with this very graphics card, the Radeon HD5770. Now, I've already done a video on this card, but it was more focused on its performance from Crossfire, so if you're interested in that, just take a look at that old video. I didn't delve too deep into the single card performance, so in this video we're going to do just that. To start, we'll get into the card's specs. It's using the Juniper GPU, which comes with 800 shading units and is clocked at 850 MHz. Its VRAM configuration consists of 1GB of GDDR5 clocked at a fast 1200 MHz, however it is on a quite narrow 128-bit bus, making for a total memory bandwidth of 77GB per second. The card supports up to DirectX 11 and OpenGL 4.4, which gives it a decent amount of longevity. Keep in mind though, any new applications could have some problems with this card, as these older API versions have pretty much been phased out by now. Its TDP is fairly low, coming in at just 108 watts, so any decent quality 300 watt or so power supply should be able to keep this card fed. Like I mentioned earlier, the HD5770 was ATI's mid-range offering in their Evergreen family. As such, it was priced accordingly at just 159 US dollars. Performance was a good improvement over its predecessor, the Radeon HD4770, but the card saw itself losing performance-wise against cheaper last-gen options like the Radeon HD4870 and GeForce GTX 260. However, there was a pretty good argument for getting the HD5770 as it had quite a few advantages like much lower power consumption than those two cards, far better API support which gave the 5770 way more longevity, and new features like Ifinity which allowed multiple monitors to appear as one, giving it some great gaming and productivity uses. Overall, you were getting a much more complete package with the HD5770. Sure, the price performance wasn't as good as some last-gen options, but these modern features gave it the leg up, especially nowadays as the HD4870 and GTX 260 have greatly inferior API support. The 5770 was such a hit that it remained the best mid-range card for quite some time. Now, Nvidia didn't like ATI dominating this sector of the market, so first they released the GTS 450 to try to shake up that mid-range sector. Unfortunately for Nvidia, the GTS 450 was slower than the HD 5770, which wouldn't have been a problem if they hadn't priced it the same. Six months later, they tried again with the GTX 550 Ti, which consistently beat the HD 5770 performance-wise, but it was priced way too high to compete. With the card's history out of the way, let's get into the card itself. I purchased this example for 20 bucks online. Given I've owned this card for over a year now, it's been holding up pretty well. The card needs to be dusted out a little bit more as this blower style fan traps a good amount of dust, but it's nothing too bad at all. This card is the OEM variant of the HD 5770, and it's using the reference cooler design dubbed Phoenix. I think it looks fantastic, as the subtle blend of black and red makes the card look quite premium. The ATI Radeon branding is a nice touch too. Cooling of the GPU was done by a small vapor chamber heatsink, which actually works really well to keep the card cool. Well then, how about some overclocking? Using MSI Afterburner, I was able to overclock the card to the tune of 1GHz on the core and 1400 MHz on the memory. That's a 15% increase to core clocks and a 17% increase to memory. This did require tuning the voltage up by 50mV up to 1175mV. Now, at these settings the card did run quite a bit hotter, so I recommend using a fixed fan speed for this overclock. My card will do 1050MHz on the core, but by then temps were getting out of control, and the small boost in performance wasn't really worth it. Alright then, now that we have everything set up, time for some benchmarks. Test system specs are on screen. All footage was captured on an external device, so there should be no hit to performance. Let's see if this old mid-range king still has game. First game up is Project Cars 3, and with the 720p resolution in the lowest settings, the card achieved averages of 38 FPS, with 1% lows down to 28. When overclocked, averages rose 8% to 41 FPS, with 1% lows rising 7% to 30. These results were captured on a pretty intensive race in the wet, with lots of cars and effects on screen. 
Overall, the game ran pretty well and offered a console-like experience. Next up is CSGO, and with the 720p resolution in the low settings with shadow set to high, the card got an average frame rate of 118 FPS, with 1% lows down to 60. When overclocked, averages rose 9% to 125 FPS, with 1% lows rising 13% to 68. Overall, it was a really smooth experience, with frame rates very rarely dropping below 60 in my capture. Still though, I am just really bad at this game. Next game up is the latest version of Minecraft, and with the 1080p resolution and the fancy settings with Optify enabled, the card got an average frame rate of 112 FPS, with 1% lows down to 48. When overclocked, averages rose 8% to 121 FPS, with 1% lows rising 4% to 50. I did notice GPU utilization was all over the place here, so not really sure what happened there. Even so, it was a pretty smooth experience, with frame rates only tanking when loading chunks, which is expected. Next is Tomb Raider, and here I ran the built-in benchmark with the 1080p resolution and the medium preset. The car got an average frame rate of 54 FPS, with 1% lows down to 44. When overclocked, averages rose 11% to 60 FPS, with 1% lows also rising 11% to 49. The game looked great and ran really well overall, with those tight frame times making for a stable experience. Next game is Crisis, and with the 1080p resolution and the normal preset, the card managed an average frame rate of 56 FPS, with 1% lows down to 30. When overclocked, averages rose 9% to 61 FPS, with 1% lows rising 7% to 32. Overall, the game ran pretty well, with some hard stops when saving. I'll say, even with the normal settings, this game still looks really good. Finally, we have Just Cause 2. Here I ran the built-in benchmark with the 1080p resolution and low settings. The card achieved an average frame rate of 53 FPS, with 1% lows down to 39. When overclocked, averages rose 9% to 58 FPS, with 1% lows rising 10% to 43. The benchmark does represent a worst case scenario in this game, so actual gameplay should be a little smoother. Aside from that, the game ran really well here and looked pretty nice thanks to that high resolution. To conclude, I'm pretty happy with the performance of this card, especially given the price. It's definitely not going to power through the latest games as it doesn't even support DirectX 12, but in some of those newer games it can deliver a nice experience. I mean, I was definitely not expecting Project Cars 3 to run that well on this card. Overall, the HD5770 is a pretty nicely performing card and could potentially be a decent budget card today if you're looking to play some of those newer DX11 titles. Anyhow. That'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.